What is hell? I maintain that it's the suffering of being unable to love. Fyodor Dostoevsky, The Brothers Karamazov. Welcome back to the series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. Canto 26 of Paradiso is a very complex canto, especially from the theological point of view. It's the canto where Dante celebrates the virtue, the theological virtue of charity, of love. And uh, it's interesting how he digs deeper uh, into each of these three virtues, because if we draw an arrow from this canto to back to canto 33 of Purgatorio, where Dante had visualized the three virtues as three beautiful ladies uh, dressed in three different colors, he's been uh, uh, touching on them, he's been referring to the theological virtues already, but he's never gone so deep into the meaning of each of them as he's doing in these three cantos 24, 25 and 26. Another arrow that we can draw here is from Canto 26 to the very end of Paradiso, which is Canto, Canto 33, the very last line where Dante says, Amor che muove il sole ed altre stelle. He uses love or charity, but Christian love, as a synonym for God in the very last line. So that's how important this uh, uh, theological virtue is. The Gospel of John in Book 1, Chapter 4 says, God is love. He who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. The fact that John focuses so much on love and charity in his Gospel is also one of the reasons why in Paradiso, in the Divine Comedy, the soul of John is the one that shines more intensely, in fact, most intensely compared to all the other souls that we've seen so far, so intensely to the point of blinding Dante. And Dante's blinding does not only have a narrative purpose, but it also has a mystical value in Paradiso, in this particular point of Paradiso, because it represents his mission, his main mission with the Divine Comedy to rekindle Christianity, to rekindle the fire of faith in a very corrupt world. This mission, of course, is, sounds very similar to the one of St. Paul, who was blinded on the way to Damascus. And, and this is the clever allusion that Dante does to Ananias in line 12, because Ananias was the person who helped St. Paul uh, after St. Paul was blinded, but we'll touch on that. It's important to focus on uh, Dante's mission, because if we go back to Canto II of Inferno, we remember that Dante said to Virgil, Io non Enea, non Paolo sono. I am not Enea's, I'm not Paul. Who am I to be burdened with this responsibility of this great mission? In fact, here in Canto 26, he finally seems to be saying, I actually am at the level in terms of uh, responsibilities and uh, skills. I, I have been chosen to carry forward a mission that is in itself almost as important as the one of St. Paul at the same level. With the hindsight, we know that uh, he was in fact quite right. So just like in the previous two cantos, Dante was tested by St. Peter on faith and then by St. James on hope, here he gets tested by St. John on charity or on love. And the dialogue on love is a very interesting, very packed, uh, very dense dialogue. I think it's particularly dense because Dante also wanted to squeeze into this Canto 26 the portion about Adam, which is towards the end. And so the, the part about the dialogue on love is even shorter, let's say, than uh, in the previous cantos. But not for this reason, it's less important. In fact, under a certain perspective, it's in fact even more important. And Dante decides to split this part, this dialogue on love, in two main portions. The first one, where he looks at love and charity mainly from a rational point of view, and the second one, where he handles the same matter of love and charity more from a personal, intimate, and uh, from the point of view of his heart, 
very, very personal uh, point of view. Now, it's probably important to understand um, what exactly these three theological virtues are. We, we heard them uh, again and again, quoted by Dante, and we generally think about them as the most important virtues for Christianity. And that's true, but where, where did they come from? So the first mention of these three virtues in the New Testament is in fact in Corinthians 1.13, written by, by St. Paul, by the Apostle Paul, where Paul identifies the, these three virtues to pinpoint exactly charity as the most important of the three, or love as the most important of the three. The definitions of these three virtues were then further clarified by St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, and they're still today valid for modern Catholicism. But it was St. Paul the first one to really highlight the three of them and to put them in uh, relation together because they don't stand on their own, but they are constantly in harmony, the three of them, almost as a, a tri triad or even almost like a trinity of virtues in themselves. St. Thomas Aquinas defined faith, hope, and charity as the three virtues that define mankind's ideal relationship with God. In fact, it's probably impossible to understand fully the Divine Comedy without understanding the meaning of the three theological virtues and the meaning behind the first book of Corinthians, which says that all forms of human knowledge are mortal and incomplete, but only love never fails. That means that when the day of resurrection comes and we are fully restored with our bodies to God, we will have no need for faith or for hope in that moment but we will still see that the, the love we had in this life is the only thing that remains because it's the nature of the God with whom we will be joined. For now, says St. Paul, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of all of these is love. A very important question to ask is, is Christian charity or Christian love a feeling? And the answer is absolutely not. It's not a feeling. Uh, the, the love of Paolo and Francesca in Inferno Canto V was a feeling. We remember how, how well they worked out for them. It, it really um, is the immature following uh, the passions only, pure passions. Um, that type of love, the Inferno V type of love, is the love of the 65-year-old uh, attorney who falls in love with his secretary. That is the type of love, and so it has nothing to do with the charity or love as a theological virtue. In fact, the definition of charity for Christianity is the infused supernatural virtue by which a person loves God above all things for his own sake and loves others for God's sake. As is true of all the theological virtues, genuine charity is an act of free will because, but because charity is a gift from God we cannot initially acquire this virtue by our own actions. God must first give it to us as a gift before we can exercise it. In his uh, important writing, Deus Caritas Est, or God is Love, Joseph Ratzinger, our current Emeritus Pope, says, in the gradual unfolding of this encounter, it is clearly revealed that love is not merely a sentiment. Love is not a sentiment. Sentiments come and go. A sentiment can be a marvelous first spark, but it's not the fullness of love. It is a characteristic of mature love that it calls into play all man's potentialities. It engages the whole man, so to speak. Contact with the visible manifestations of God love, God's love can awaken within us a feeling of joy born of the experience of being loved. However, this encounter also engages our will and our intellect. Acknowledgement of the living God is one path towards love, and the yes of our will to his will unites our intellect, our will, and our sentiments in the all-embracing act of love. So it's something to make us reflect about how much complex, how much more mature the concept of Christian love is compared to, let's call it the mainstream idea of love, or even the pop music idea of love. The love story between God and man, continues Joseph Ratzinger, 
consists in the very fact that this communion of will increases in a communion of thought and sentiment, and thus our will and God's will increasingly coincide. It's really this uh, reunification of our desire and the good, the absolute good, that is at the heart of Christianity. God's will is no longer for me an alien will, something imposed on me from without the commandments, but it is now my own will, my own desire, based on the realization that God is in fact more deeply present to me than I am to myself. So I hope this introduction was helpful to put things in context at least for, for this Canto 26 because there will be so much more to really dig into. But we don't have, and we haven't read as many books as Dante had, at least I haven't. The Canto starts uh, with uh, Dante still in the kind of fog of blindness and he says, Mentrio dubbiava per lo viso spento della vulgita fiamma che lo spense uscì un spiro che mi fece attento. It's interesting the choice of word spiro because spiro means a breath and so I like the way Mandelbaum translates it as there breathed a voice that centered my attention and I also have here Anthony A. Solen's translation. He also says there came a breath that held my spirit tense. Very uh, accurate translations. And uh, we get to the, the three questions that John asks Dante. He's going to ask him three main questions and Dante will provide three answers. The first one might be the most important one because the first one is at verse uh, 7 where John says, Comincia dunque e di ove s'appunta l'anima tua. This very interesting verb, appunta. We could translate this or let's say understand this as where does your soul tend to with uh, its own desire, with its own desire. Or we could even say that John is asking Dante, what is the utmost uh, object of your love? What is the utmost object of your love, Dante? And this is why I do um, like the way that the Mandelbaum translates it, which is declare the aim on which your soul is set. It's fairly straightforward. Anthony Zolen translates this uh, first question as begin and tell to what felicity your soul aspires as to its single end. It's a little more complex, but it does absolutely hit the nail on the head of what John is asking. And e fa ragion che sia la vista in te smarrita e non defunta. Remember that you haven't really lost your sight. It's only temporary because the, the eyes of Beatrice will heal you exactly in the same way that Ananias healed St. Paul. And here, as I mentioned before, is the reference to the story of St. Paul being blinded by a light on the way to Damascus. In fact, it would be interesting here to read from the Acts of Apostles, uh, Book 9, where uh, this scene is described. And uh, Saul, as St. Paul was called before converting to Christianity, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, he had heard Jesus' voice. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat or drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So Ananias uh, accepted this. He went to this house and uh, cured um, Saul, who then became Paul or St. Paul uh, of his bl temporary blindness. This, as we've seen, is a way for Dante to clarify his mission and to communicate to us his uh, self-awareness, his awareness of the high importance of his mission. Then shortly after, there is uh, one of my favorite tercets of this canto, which is Io dissi, al suo piacere e tosto e tardo, venia remedio agli occhi, 
che fuor porte quando ella entrò col fuoco on Dio sempre ardo. It seems like a casual and uh, quickly passing by tercet or comment from Dante, but it's so central. It's so central to the Divine Comedy because he's going back here not only to the love for Beatrice, which is animating the entire Divine Comedy, but it's also this foco, which means fire, is the love, is the same love that is still burning in his heart after so many years, from that fatal moment when he saw Beatrice for the first time. And this is also the perfect introduction, this is why Dante is saying this, is the perfect introduction to the important dialogue about love and about charity that he's gonna have with John. It's so typical of Dante to think about his own eyes because vision was so crucial to Dante as the gates or the door through which love initially came through into his heart. He was like an empty vessel and then through Beatrice, love conquered his heart and started burning like a fire inside him through the gate of his eyes. The first answer that Dante gives is uh, not 100% clear to all scholars, or at least scholars are, uh, have slightly different uh, interpretations. Because Dante says, Lo ben che fa contenta questa corte, and this is clearly a reference to God, the good with which this court is satisfied. This is clearly God. Alpha and Omega is Alpha and Omega of all writings. Di quanta scrittura, scrittura means writings, or even scripture. The love has, loud or low, read out to me. Che, di quanta scrittura mi legge amore o lievemente o forte. There are two ways in which scholars have read, especially this scrittura or writings. The first one is scrittura meaning, metaphorically, of all type of affection that my heart has felt uh, that can fall under the umbrella of love. So every type of uh, declination of love that I have felt throughout my life. Other scholars say that this couple of verses should be interpreted as uh, God is the beginning and the end of every writings that I've read, actual writings, could be philosophical, theological, biblical writings, that learn, that taught me, taught me how to love, how to properly love in a mature way. In any case, what's important is that Dante's answer is very clearly saying the ultimate desire towards which my soul is tending, is uh, pretended towards, is God. So that's the, the direction of my, of my utmost desire. And this is, of course, the, the right answer to give to John. John, however, is not satisfied and uh, he uses this beautiful um, simile of uh, um, a finer sieve, angusto vaglio. He would like Dante to use a finer sieve with uh, smaller holes to really articulate this concept uh, in a more sophisticated way, in a finer way, and uh, to give us, uh, uh, to give John uh, a more satisfying answer. So to help him give such a more sophisticated answer, John uh, articulate, better articulates his own question and he says, okay, so please tell me who led your bow to aim at such a target, at the target of God. So to be clear, it's here at uh, verse 25 that Dante starts uh, the first part of his main answer and in this first part or first sequence of the dialogue on love, Dante gives uh, uh, an answer that is based mainly on uh, rational reasons or philosophical reasons. And it's only later on at uh, line 52 or verse 52 that the second part of his dialogue starts, the more personal, intimate, and straight from his own heart. That's, that was Dante's, Dante's decision to split this uh, dialogue in two main parts, the one from verse 25 and the one from verse uh, 52. This first portion the philosophical one or the rational one <clears throat> reminds us of uh, Purgatorio Canto 18 where Dante had uh, expressed all the movements in a very fine way, the movements of love, that love, what happens in our heart when we feel love, when we, when we are caught by love for the first time and how all those uh, different steps uh, uh, follow one another 
in the movements of love. When it comes to the love of God and our love for God, what's crucial, what's important is that our love is a responsive type of love because we merely love back. And it's fascinating how Dante is correlating here the love for God, especially from the philosophical standpoint, to the meaning of good, of what is goodness, what is good. Um, it's fascinating because it draws, it draws this concept back to Aristotle. In line 37, he says, Tal vero all'intelletto mio sterne colui che mi dimostra il primo amore, the first love, di tutte le sostanze sempiterne. He's in fact referring to Aristotle here. More specifically, Dante is surely referring to a book that he had read that was called The Causes, or Book on Causes, that was attributed to Aristotle in the Middle Ages. And uh, in his Convivio, Dante wrote about this, uh, the causes. He, he wrote, the human soul naturally wills, with all its desire, to exist. And since its being depends upon God and is preserved by him, it naturally desires and wills to be united with God in order to fortify his being. And this uniting is that which we call love. In fact, the definition of God as the first cause or the first mover is a definition by Aristotle that comes precisely from Aristotle's writings. Dante continues and says, Sterne la voce del verace autore, che dice a Moise di se parlando, io ti farò vedere ogni valore. He's saying that another source for this philosophical understanding, rational understanding, is in fact the Old Testament, where God is speaking to Moses. In fact, the true author is God himself, who after Moses said, show me your glory, I beg you, speaking with God, he replied, I shall show you all goodness in uh, Exodus 33. That's where, that's the biblical source. And Dante is translating from the Vulgate. God is all goodness, the all-inclusive and highest good, and therefore rightly to be loved more than everything else. And as a final source in this beautiful list of sources for Dante's understanding, let's remember that here we are at a very, very high level in Paradiso, in Dante's theology, in Christian theology in general. And that's how much Dante valued John. This is how much Christianity valued John. The Gospel of John is a notch up compared to the other three in terms of theological profundity. This is an undisputed fact. So Dante says, Sternil mi tu ancora, tu means you, John. Incominciando l'alto preconio che grida l'arcano di qui laggiù sovra ogni altre band. band. It's almost a homage to John uh, to say how um, important and uh, how much more valuable really, uh, especially the beginning of John's gospel, which is world famous, world renowned. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God this uh, very famous beginning of, of John's Gospel marks its uh, very metaphysical characteristics and more metaphysical accent all throughout the, the Gospel. Then I find the next two tercets um, really interesting because what John does here is uh, he summarizes what Dante has said correctly to him and then to push the argument further and to get Dante to be become even more real, more personal, he um, uses this uh, simile of biting, uh, and of teeth biting, con quanti denti questa morte morde. Um, explain to me, Mandelbaum says, uh, tell me if you feel other chords draw you toward him, so that you voice aloud all of the teeth by which this love grips you. And what I like here is uh, the sense of uh, physicality, the sense of reality, that Dante is applying to theology. And it's such a typical move by Dante here. He He's never simply satisfied by airy-fairy theology or just simply philosophy, which has very deep meanings. But he wants to make it personal. He wants to make it as real as possible. And what's more real than the senses, than the physical sense of biting on something? In fact, we think about love. Love is something that actually bites. 
in in our life in our experience we, we can how can we deny that so that's why here finally dante gives uh, the most heartfelt and uh, poetic maybe and, and beautiful answer um, che l'essere del mondo e l'essere mio la morte che sostenne per chi io viva e quel che spera ogni fedel com'io these lines are so thick so thick with me so dense con la predetta conoscenza viva where he says, uh, la morte che el sostenne per chi viva, the death that he sustained so that I can live, is salvation through the, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. E quel che spera ogni fedel comio, he goes back to the concept of hope, everything that any other faithful person, every other Christian like me, is hoping for. So he's referring to eternal life, eternal salvation, eternal beatitude. Con la predetta conoscenza viva, tratto manno del mar dell'amor torto e del diritto man posto alla riva. These two lines are probably just as important as the two lines at uh, um, verse 14 at fif and 15, where Dante previously referred to his love for Beatrice and how it originated. Why are they so important? Because He's now here drawing a line between where he is here in, uh, in uh, Canto 26 of Paradiso and the very beginning of the Divine Comedy, where, if, you, if you, we remember, he, was, uh, he, made, he wrote a simile of himself coming out of some kind of troubled waters and turning around as if behind him there were uh, a terrible um, mare dell'amor torto uh, it was the sea of the wrongly directed love that's where Dante is coming from the situation of deep crisis where he found himself at the very beginning of the Divine Comedy is this mar dell'amor torto this sea where he couldn't understand what the right love was let's remember one more time all of Inferno exists because many people do not understand with their intellect what the goodness, what the good is, what the mature type of love is, and, uh, and not as an imaginary torture chamber like very superficially some people intend it to be. So we could say that lines 62 and 63 are almost a small summary of the entire Divine Comedy. This drew me from the sea of twisted love and set me on the shore of the right love. We could use this, in fact, as a two-line summary of, of the entire poem. And as I was mentioning before, this is how Dante describes the virtue of love, not as something that's purely theoretical, but as something personal. That's the way he personally lived through the virtue of love in his own life. Very intimate, very real, very biting. At this point, the test or the dialogue is uh, finished, is completed. All the souls sing the Sanctus. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. And they sing in joy. And uh, immediately, Dante's vision starts uh, coming back. In a way that uh, even some, uh, from a scientific point of view, has been highlighted as really important. Because when, da when Dante mentions uh, lo splendor che va di gonna in gonna, it's, he's almost saying something that is biologically true, which is within our retinas, within our eye bulb, there are different layers, and uh, he's describing the light that hits layer after layer, the gonna in gonna, in a very accurate, in a very biologically accurate way. So we get finally to line 79, which is really the end of this first uh, beautiful part if we want to split the, the canto in two parts this is the end of the first one and then from line 80 the second part of the canto starts on the may che dinanzi vidi poi Dante's vision not only has come back but it's uh, being elevated, it's transformed at this point it's a stronger vision and the first thing that Dante does with his new vision he looks around and he sees there, he sees there is a fourth soul and this fourth soul is in fact the soul of Adam, the first man. He really wanted to include this uh, uh, character here also because of an architectural reason. In the Divine Comedy, 
we know that uh, in Canto 26 of Inferno and partially in Canto 26 of Purgatorio as well, Dante has specifically made some reflections about language. We know that writing the, the Vulgari Eloquentia and other essays, Dante was really almost obsessed with language and with the history of language. And it's very interesting uh, what comes out, what, what really emerges from this dialogue with, uh, with Adam here. So Adam, who is uh, called by Dante as the pomo, pomo means really apple or the fruit, fruit that was the only one to be brought forth already ripe, Adam, um, makes us think of course of Genesis and uh, the concept of original sin and all those ancient, ancient uh, myths that we know are in fact even older than Christianity because they've been honed and uh, sculpted by time so much that they really reveal uh, an essential type of truth. In fact, the concept of original sin is stereotypically intended sometimes as uh, something of a, a way to control people. You have your original sin, therefore there's something wrong about you, and only through us, the church, who sell you a product, you're gonna be able to be saved. This is absolutely incorrect and cynical, but it's still today sometimes um, seen this way. In fact, the, the concept of original sin is a very deep, uh, it's a profound uh, uh, psychological concept that without going too deep into it, um, means and is always meant um, a way to express the fact that human beings, all of us, are uh, very messed up creatures. We are messed up because of the power of our imagination that no other animal has. We have such a powerful imagination that we can imagine things like perfection, we can imagine infinity, we can imagine utter goodness, and by our ability itself to imagine, we are messed up because, because it's impossible to reconcile practically the heights of our imagination with reality. Uh, but this is really what defines us as beings, as uh, we can call it earthly beings. That's why Christianity, just like any other major religion, is, comes with the instructions on how to make the best use of this incredibly powerful weapon that we have, which is our imagination. How to properly direct it in a way that is good to us and good to all the other people around us, as opposed to in a disordered or a dysfunctional way. So pretty soon Adam talks to Dante and uh, in knowing already what Dante is going to ask him, he expresses, articulates the four questions that Dante has for him. These questions are, you wish to hear how long it is since I was placed by God in the high garden where this lady readied you to climb a stair in Eden, and just how long it pleased my eyes, and number three, the true cause of the great anger, and number four, four what idiom I used and shaped. Probably number four is the question that was most interesting to Dante because of his obsession with language and his love for the history of language. But the other three questions are also very crucial. What's very important and what's really educational when it comes to Genesis and uh, the theology that's, that's behind Genesis is this uh, quick couple of lines, 115, 16, where Adam tells Dante, non il gustar del legno fu per sé la cagion di tanto esilio ma solamente il trapassar del segno. What condemned me and what really brought forth uh, original sin because of my fault was not the fact in itself that I ate the apple. Uh, Eve and I ate the apple, not the eating in itself, but il trapassar del segno, or my trespass of the boundary, the fact that uh, Adam and Eve didn't accept that this uh, uh, fruit of the of the tree of knowledge was to be received by God, but they actually took it for themselves with uh, arrogance and with hubris. About this uh, point, in his uh, um, Yearning for Paradise, beautiful book, Father Paul Pearson says, they didn't take something evil, 
they took into their own hands something that was God's to give. That is the difference. If Original Sin were to have a theme song, it could fittingly be I Did It My Way, uh, sang by Frank Sinatra, which I find it really funny because uh, every time I hear that song, it's uh, the lyrics are so fitting of somebody who doesn't accept any divinity around him and uh, he takes him his own ego as his own divinity and his own god. There are then some uh, calculations about uh, Adam's life in history. Um, we can deduce from, from these calculations that Adam's birth was in 5198 before Christ scientifically laughable today strangely not for everyone though as, as you know there are some uh, young earth creationists around the world who still believe that the earth is 6,000 year old and I heard some of them talk and they are really convinced about that but uh, Adam says that he was in limbo for 4,302 years and he lived for 930 years so this are specific technical quest, uh, answers to Dante's question. Something that is uh, really striking about this passage on uh, Adam is that Dante, Dante's uh, interpretation and uh, intellectual position is different here from uh, his position in De Vulgari Eloquentia, that was his book about uh, language. So his position has evolved and uh, is now different. In the Vulgari Eloquentia, Dante had accepted the traditional opinion that uh, the Adam's language had been conserved, had remained exactly the same since Adam's times, and uh, as given by God. The, it was some kind of ancient Hebrew language in the traditional opinion. Here, on the other hand, he is uh, affirming that the um, changing nature of language, the changing nature not only of language but uh, of every type of language and therefore including the very first language that Adam spoke. And, uh, and so his position is different and in doing this he also is uh, justifying his own personal choice to use the Florentine vernacular language to write the Divine Comedy because he knows that it's a mortal, changing, developing language and not an eternal language even if the poem that he's writing is a sacred poem like he told us in the previous canto. So it's an, it's an interesting choice partially probably dictated by his own reflections about the Divine Comedy but also by the fact that Dante was uh, an exquisite linguist. He was extremely sensitive to any kind of changes of language and this, is what, and this is what we've seen in Inferno 26, in uh, Purgatorio 26, where he tries to imitate other languages and refers to the differences of, of languages throughout history. Thank you so, so much for watching this video, for listening to these uh, comments and commentaries. I, I hope I could uh, shed some light on Canto 26. And let's move on. Let's go even higher to Canto 27 with the next video. Bye.